Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. You know, great to be at the stage of my auditorium, my school. And, um, you know, what an honor it is to be on this stage at TEDx. And um, like everyone else here, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm a storyteller. I'm not, I get some people call me an artist. You know, I'm, I'm a storyteller. And I'm here to share with you my story. You see, when I first got asked to do a TED Talk, is, um, I Googled it to see what it was all about, and um, one of the speakers came up. Uh, she, said, she said she was fine until she got on stage, and then she saw the timer, and then she noticed how it was ticking down, and uh, it reminded her very much of a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I'm from Afghanistan, and uh, <laughs> that's the last thing I want to be reminded of. <laughs> but anyway, Earlier this year, I went back to Afghanistan with my father, and uh, this photo was taken from behind our house in the tiny little village of Jogheri, and uh, that's, that's sunset on the, on the black mountains at the back. And this next photo is down on the valley floor in front of my house, and that's me with one of the young ones there. And this photo was taken right there. That green door is the green door to my house that I grew up in. You see, Back in 2001, when the Taliban were at the heart of their power, everything changed. What do you see? What do you think when you think of the word Afghanistan? What comes into your mind? Soldiers, bombs, death, improvised explosive devices, just like the ones that were used to kill five of our brave troops only two weeks ago. But this is my Afghanistan. This is what comes into my mind every time I think of home. So back in 2001, when the, when the Taliban took over, well, when they were at the heart of their power, life was bad. This didn't exist anymore. All concepts of, of basic human rights were thrown out the window. Women were forced to stay at home, you know, stay uneducated or restricted from teaching. Men were forced to grow beards and simply accept the judgment of the local commander, you know, whatever that may be. Life as we knew it had changed. So there we were in 2001, um, me and my, my family being part of the ethnic minority, the Hazaras, we were, we were persecuted and executed. We were seen by the Taliban and their people as a tumour that needed to be cut and gotten rid of. For half-time entertainment at local football match matches, my people were brought on onto the field and stoned to death education en masse for the price of disobedience. And so as you can imagine, my father made the decision for our family to leave, seek a fresh start, somewhere new, a new beginning. And that new beginning was going to be Australia. So we set out in the spring of 2001. Under the cover of night, we arrived in Pakistan, in Karachi. And um, already life was different, and I was in the next country. Our family stayed in a one-bedroom apartment while our, pa while our traveling papers were organized. And I celebrated my seventh birthday in Pakistan. Indonesia was going to be the next step. So I remember, I remember the journey clearly because uh, it was the first time I'd boarded a plane. And uh, I can tell you, no, it wasn't no Star Alliance member, no Air New Zealand. <laughs> Cramped into a rickety old plane, we, I couldn't understand how we managed to stay in one piece when we arrived in Indonesia. And oh man, what a difference, you know? The, the heat, the humidity, the, the bananas, the, the never-ending expanse of water, you know? Where the hell were we? But anyway, we stayed, we stayed in Indonesia for two months while once again, traveling papers organized, and you know, we had to find a ship, someone to get us to New Zealand. Well, not New Zealand at this time, obviously. Australia, we didn't even know this tiny island nation existed. <laughs> then one night, you know, we'd been here for two months, and then one night, I was startled awake by my mother, and she said, said, we're leaving. And me, being unawares, not knowing, I was seven at the time, unawares, I was like, okay, you know, let's leave. We were leaving tonight. Oh, wow. So I quickly grabbed on to as many clothes as I could. I chucked them on, you know, tried to save some space in my bag. And we were hurried off into a bus. 
in the middle of the night, this is all pitch black darkness, you couldn't see anything. In the middle of the night, we were rushed off to, to a port, Port Merak in Indonesia. And um, in Port Merak, we, we caught up with some of the other Hazara families who were also escaping the atrocities back home. But we couldn't see anyone, couldn't distinguish numbers or whatnot. So there we were, and we were, and we were hurried along into the belly of this, this unknown ship. And um, we, couldn't, we, could, we couldn't understand. We knew we were at the port because we could hear the crashing of the waves, but we didn't know, we didn't know where we were. We just hurried along into the ship. You know, what sort of ship is this? How big it is? The next day, I got the chance to truly explore this vessel, you know, the MV Palapa 2, as it was known. And I hate to think what happened to Palapa 1. <laughs> the MV Palapa 2 was a fishing vessel. And uh, just like fish, 438 Afghans, mostly Afghans, were crammed into a space that was meant to hold 40. And uh, I, remember, I remember needing to go to the bathroom, and when I discovered that it was simply a, a hole in the, in the deck that ran straight into the ocean, I didn't need to go to the bathroom anymore. <laughs> but anyway, uh, on the second day, the engine failed. And uh, that night, a storm hit. And here, you know, this was the scariest moment of the whole journey. Not for me, but for everyone. As a kid, you know, I thought I was on a big adventure, but put yourselves in my father's position. He thought that he was offering us a chance, his family a chance at a fresh start. And now, in this situation, when, the mercy, when the, our boat was at the mercy of the waves, he thought that he'd condemned us to death. The men all reached the lowest point of their lives at this point. And still thinking about it, back at it today, I think, how the hell did we survive that night? Because it was a miracle. The, the men at that point were praying, praying to God that, please save us, you know, if we're to drown tonight, please wash our bodies on some shore so we could be buried on land. But the next day, it eventuated, and a, sm and a small plane flew overhead. And, you know, as you can imagine, you know, uh, there was a sense of hope that, you know, this plane would see us and, and would be rescued, but nothing happened. And the one man who's sitting at the back of the auditorium who thought that, uh, but, you know, he could speak some English, we write the letters SOS and put it up so then uh, next time it flies past, he'll see us. And it did. But again, nothing happened. Morning turned into evening, and all sense of hope was lost again. But that evening, God heard our prayers, for out of the horizon came the MV Tampa. MV Tampa is a Norwegian cargo ship heading from Fremantle in Western Australia to Singapore, and it picked up our distress signal that the captain had put up. And that's our little boat right there, you know, anchored next to the next to the, H, the MV Tampa. And so as the last man got up, got up out of the Palapa, the Palapa sank, taking with it everything that we bought from Afghanistan and Pakistan to start our new lives elsewhere. It sank and is now at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. Here we wanted to go. We slept in containers, empty containers, and we prayed on deck. And we wanted to know that we wanted to go to Australia, to Christmas Island, because is under Australian control, and, it would, and hopefully here would be processed and sent to Australia. Now, this, this was it. Here we are, the last stepping stone. We're going to go. But Australia at this time was in the midst of an election, and policy had changed. John Howard closed the doors on Australia to further his campaign. And so Captain Rennan, a brave man, a risk taker, he, he chose... He headed straight for Christmas Island, but you know, within 10 kilometers of Christmas Island, we were forced back by SAS troops. And under pressure from his own bosses, Renan couldn't hold us anymore because he needed to get his freight to Singapore. He couldn't, he couldn't be a host for us anymore, and so we changed. We were transferred onto the HMAS Menorah, a Navy frigate. And this was a lot better, for we had bedding and shower facilities, but still we had no sense of direction. We, had, we were just wading out on the ocean with nowhere to go. While we were on there, 9-11 happened, but we were unaware, because New Zealand put up its hand. Who or what is in New Zealand? <laughs> That's what we were thinking. But we didn't care, for New Zealand was the end of our six-month journey from that tiny little village you saw at the front, at the, in the picture. So there, once we arrived in New Zealand, 28th of September, 2001, in the tarmac of Auckland Airport, we felt home. 
for the first time, we felt on solid ground. And so we were transferred, we were transferred to Mangere Refugee Centre, and from there, I've been living in Christchurch for the past 11 years. That's me and my dad right now, when we went back at the start of the year back to Afghanistan, and to think where we've come from and where, we've in, where, we've, where I am right now, where I'm standing on this stage today, is a story of hope. And I want to tell all of you, and this is my, my message to all of you, you know, we're all going through a tough time right now. This, this, this country right now is the last landmass to be colonized. Everyone in this auditorium is either a migrant, a refugee, or a descendant of one. It's forever enriching its identity with people from all over the world. And so if I, in final regards, I just want to tell you, you know, we're all going through a tough time. You know, never lose hope because there are other people going through tougher times. We all have the power to make a difference. As I graduate and head off, this, head off from this stage and go into university down the road, I wonder, how can I make a difference? But the reality is we all have the power to make a difference. And that can be as easy as listening to someone tell their story. Thank you. Don't go, don't go just there, because we're going to acknowledge your family. Um, the word uh, tamper um, looms very large in, uh, in history, and so to have met somebody who came here from the tamper is a huge privilege. Okay. You asked... Um, who or what is New Zealand? The simple answer is you are, um, and you didn't come on your own. And so we'd like to acknowledge family and friends in the audience if they'd like to stand, please. You're out there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks very much.